Mo most of you are Israelis here, so you don't suspect that this is the views around the Weizmann Institute. Uh, it's actually Wadi Ram in Jordan. And well, these slides will be kind of anecdotically incorporated into the talk. So if you have no interest in protein evolution, you can just wait for the, for, for the mountain slides. Uh, just as a matter of introduction, this is a very broad kind of school with, with, and most of you have no background, or this is what I was told in biology. So the idea is, I think I have uh, here about 100 slides, and I know I can fire them at a rate of about two per, per minute. But this is not the idea, so I think it would be on the other hand, there might be some things that are trivial for those of you that do have a, some background in biology. So if I'm going kind of into a realm where, where the, the, the basics of it, the fundamentals are not understood, uh, then, then just stop me and ask a question. I'd rather go through maybe, you know, a third of it. It doesn't matter, just to give you an impression, but that people will grasp kind of the maybe the rationale behind what we are doing or, or, or the, what proteins are or how they evolve rather than uh, basically go through the whole thing and, and end up with most people don't understanding anything. So I'll start with a couple of slides to try and convince you how wonderful proteins are, maybe even more sophisticated than computers. So plotted are here are the rates and half-lives for a series of chemical reactions, transformations, that are absolutely essential for every life form, be it the most primitive bacterium or humans. And as you can see, the half-lives of the spontaneous rate of this reaction span over many orders of magnitude. Some of them may go within a minute, but some may take a billion years. And what proteins do, or specifically a certain class of proteins called enzymes that catalyze these chemical transformations, is to accelerate the rate of these reactions so that it can proceed with a time scale that is compatible with, uh, with life, basically. So if you look at these reactions when performed in the presence or catalyzed by an enzyme, by a protein, the rates, this huge span of rates, will be compressed basically to the second to the micro, from, from the second to the microsecond timescale. To do this, some enzymes have to take some of these reactions and accelerate their rates by 17 orders of magnitude, which is a significant rate acceleration. So overall, I could say that proteins are highly specialized and proficient molecular processes, if you like to use the language of, of the previous lecture. And that is that the, each protein has specialized in a very specific task, be it catalyzing the transformation of a certain reaction with a very specific substrate, and they do that very, very well. Now, in general, if you look at highly proficient and specialized devices or, or, or human beings or whatever that is, they are also so specialized that changing their mode of operation, if you like, is becoming more and more difficult as they become more specialized. However, proteins have somehow retained this ability to be highly specialized and proficient in the task they perform on the one hand, but also evolve and change their function very rapidly. So they kind of maintain two seemingly contradictory properties of being highly specialized on the one hand and highly flexible and evolvable on the other. And I will try today to kind of show you prove few properties of proteins that enable this duality, this dichotomy. So 
So just as a matter of, as an example for the ease by which new proteins evolve in nature, I will give you this enzyme, which is called phosphotrasiesterase or organophosphate hydrolyze. This enzyme was identified about 20 years ago in soil bacteria that grew next to sites that were in which pesticides or insecticides were stored and used extensively. No natural substrate, no natural compound has been identified as a substrate for this enzyme. But it became apparent that this molecule called parauxone, or in its derivative called parathion, which are heavily used pesticides, is a substrate for this enzyme. It's not just a substrate for this enzyme, but the enzyme breaks down this molecule with an efficiency that is very close to the diffusion limit. That is to say that it seems that the only thing that limits the speed of conversion of this compound, its hydrolysis, its degradation by the enzyme, is the time it takes the substrate to diffuse into the active site. We measure enzyme efficiency in a parameter called K cut over Km, which as you can see is like one over concentration multiplied by one over time. And I will use these numbers as we go along. And just to give you a feel, this is already 10 to the 8 molar minus 1 second minus 1 is, as I said, very close to the diffusion limit. It's also been observed that bacteria that carry this enzyme can grow on this pesticide as the only source of phosphorus. So they usually, we and bacteria take out the phosphorus that we need that is absolutely essential because DNA is, amongst other things, is made of phosphorus from inorganic phosphate. But inorganic phosphate is, is quite scarce in soil and it seems that these bacteria evolved to utilize this organic source of phosphate for growth. The mystery is that this enzyme has been identified 20 years ago, but this compound was introduced to this planet about 60 years ago. So within 40 years, it seems that these bacteria have managed to evolve an enzyme that is highly specialized because this enzyme takes almost no other substrate and highly proficient in what it does. This one, I think, yes, because it was made by chemists as a pesticide. What one may ask is whether a similar, similar compounds were not, you know, to say absolutely no, is it, but, but it's un very unlikely that. But in fact, if you look at this chemistry, whereas phosphorus is, of course, very abundant in natural compounds or products, this particular arrangement of a triester is unknown. There isn't a single natural metabolite or compound that will, that have this chemistry. Is it clear that it didn't have another function and, or <coughs> close relative of it had another function and then was utilized? So, it? ten slides ahead we will see what its closest relative, what function its closest relative had and how it's related to this. But, you know, all these things that I say with absolute conviction are, of course, based on some kind of an extrapolation, yes, that it could be that, I don't know, as we speak, someone will identify a natural substrate for this enzyme, but it seems, also when one examines the structure, the mechanism, everything seems to be tailored to this artificial substrate. And as to be said, this is not the only example. We have now, I think, well over 50 examples of enzymes to you that evolved to degrade uh, chemicals that were, you know, introduced by us. So the question is how, you know, this or to, for that sake, any other protein would evolve. How this transition from 
an existing protein that has a certain sequence and a certain function and a certain structure would occur to give you a new sequence and function and structure. So the kind of more common or, or I don't know, obvious way to do this is what, what, by what you may call bioinformatics. And that is to look at what we know about contemporary proteins and then look by this rationale of let's see what the closest relative of this protein does. And maybe this would teach us something about how this enzyme evolved. The problem with this approach is that it only gives us a glimpse about what could have been a starting point and what may have been the end point of this process, but it tells you nothing about the you know, path that actually may connect these two points. So it's kind of the kind of information that a helicopter pilot will be happy with, but not if you are a hiker or a climber. There is no sufficient information in that to tell you how you get from here to there. And we can exemplify it by looking at the closest relative of this enzyme, this pesticide degrading enzyme that I've mentioned. So if you look for relatives in terms of sequence and st or, or structure, you find enzymes that have essentially the same scaffold, the same arrangement of the polypeptide change of the protein scaffold, and essentially the same chemistry within the active site. The problem is that in sequence, they are well under 50% identity, which means that these proteins are separated by well over 150 amino acid exchanges. So just looking at the possible starting point and end point doesn't tell you much about the path. In particular because evolution is a process that is underlined by two kind of uh, key features. The one is that it's gradual. That is, it occurs by one mutation at the time, one sequence exchange, if you like, at the time. So it's one step at the time. So these proteins are separated by at least 150 steps, if not more. The other feature of it is that the process has to be smooth. That is, following each and every mutation or exchange of the sequence, an intermediate is formed, and that intermediate has to be functional. Otherwise, the process reaches a dead end. Evolution relies on going through a sequence of intermediates that all have function, that all have fitness. The minute you lose that function, this path becomes closed. It will not continue. So this is a kind of very important principle of Darwinian evolution that the process has to be gradual and smooth. It's incremental improvements from one generation to another, from one mutation to another. So the information that is given to us by contemporary proteins is insufficient to understand how a putative ancestor has diverged in, in sequence and in function to give these different enzymes. So another related question is that do we know enough about proteins and especially about protein evolution to make new ones? to make new proteins. And kind of both these questions or issues can be tackled by a field which is known as laboratory evolution or in vitro evolution or directed evolution that aims to reproduce the evolution of new proteins in the laboratory and in real time. To just perform this trick, if you like, of taking a, a starting point and devolving it to a, to a given end point. The advantage of laboratory evolution is that it allows us to monitor the process and to isolate all the intermediates and follow the path that connects these two points. So 
So the basic, I don't know, if you like, algorithm or, or process that underlines laboratory evolution borrows from Darwinian evolution the two key components. And these are genetic diversity and selection. So the way the evolution works is that we have a starting point. In our case, because we're focusing on a single protein, this would be a, a gene that encodes a given protein. That gene is duplicated or replicated. And during this process, errors are introduced. So the, the, the replication, the copying process, is, occurs with limited fidelity. However, the nature of these mistakes is that they are completely random. Their location and you know, from what to what is not dictated by the natural selection. So the process of generating diversity is, is random and results in a whole population, if you like, of genes that are all derived from the mother gene and each carry a different mutation or a different sequence change in a different location. And then this population or repertoire of library or gene library, if you, if, as, as the way we call it, is subjected to selection. And the aim of selection is to weed out those very few sequence changes out of the entire population that would induce a change of function in the protein and would provide an advantage with respect to that function under selection. And this process... of like recombination uh, or... Like you said it's just duplication and mutation. So that means is there any uh, mechanism of mixing? So the mutation, you know, or, or most of them or many of the mutations or when you visit, would be a change of a single nucleotide, right? That would result in a change of a single amino acid. But mutation can be also inserting a sequence coming from a completely different gene into your gene. It can be deleting a piece. It can be recombining a piece of that gene with a piece from a completely another gene. So it can be a much more complex event than the, you know, in this PowerPoint annotation, yes? But in principle, and to simplify matters, we were looking at variants that are all derived from the, from the starting gene and that differ in sequence. Not entirely, that's the point I was trying to make. They're all derivatives of the original sequence, but they differ, not necessarily in a single nucleotide. Functionality of the protein? Couldn't there be a mutation that doesn't cause a, a change in the functionality, but will later with another <laughs> So we will discuss that as well, yes. But in principle, if you look at the simple scenario, this would be, this is placed under selection for, for a new function. Because if the original function is needed, yes, then basically we, we are assuming a, a starting condition where the organism is perfectly happy and it's current genes are fulfilling any function that is needed for its survival, yes? But in the meantime, it's accumulating mutations, of course, and then if circumstances change, a new environment is introduced, then selection would act to pick up those mutations that become beneficial under the new environment. Don't so when doing laboratory evolution, do you think of it as a mimic of what happened in real life? Or do you, because if so, I mean, in real life, there, it's so much more complex. You have transposons and viral uh, DNA insertions. and Of course. Uh, so I mean, what you said is that you take the base um, 
DNA you, you start with is only one set, but you lose yeah. the whole variety. But so do, do you infer of what you get from the lab to real life, or do you use it for other? Uh, sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. For example, I think I don't think Barfile is listed in the LA directory, but uh, yes, this is an, a simplified scenario, and the you know weakness and power of it lies in this oversimplification. Because if you take, of course, a whole organism, a whole you know, bacteria, and you place it now in a new environment, and you see that, as, whereas before it was hardly growing, and now it's prospering and perfectly happy, it would be very difficult to say what happened that you know, made this, this change. Yes? Whereas here is a very kind of, it's a closed system where we know all the ingredients that we put in, and we know all the ingredients that we put out, and we are interested that what happens to an individual protein in with, you know, when it needs to change its function or structure. Yeah. I can tell you that you know, upon comparison to what we know had happened in nature, for example, you know, this enzyme, in some cases we see a very nice correlation with you know, the mutations and so on that happened in nature. In some cases we create a, an artificial solu solution that is not comparable to, to what happened in nature. Oops. Okay, so just to make sure we, we know the con this might be trivial, so I'll go over it quickly, but the idea is that the gene is made of DNA. The DNA, although it's a molecule that has been glorified and for maybe a very good reason, but it has actually only two main jobs. The one is for provides kind of a blueprint for making proteins, so these are the instructions for making proteins. And of course, it's the hereditary material. So these instructions are inherited to the next generation. So overall, if you look at a very kind of simple scheme of an organism, we would have the DNA, which is the information or instructions. This would be translated to proteins that confer function. And if you want to look at evolution with a very kind of, again, simplistic view, you would have DNA or the genes that make proteins that confer function that is related to the survival of the organism. Okay, evolution works by virtue of having certain DNA sequences or certain genes encoding proteins that can, that have an improved function or a more suitable function under a given environment that in turn confer higher survival. And this circle, you know, turns on by basically hereditary, meaning that the genes get inherited to the next generation. So if there is a beneficial sequence change in the DNA, it will be inherited to the offsprings, and they can evolve further, and so on and so forth. And in this way, you can enhance these cycles of creating genetic diversity, subjecting it to selection to, that would choose or give advantage to the best variants or the best alleles, and go on with this cycle. Kind of the most basic or rudimentary requirement for this cycle is to couple the gene, the DNA, with the function, with the survival. Because if an organism survives and the genes do not survive, this process will be, will grind to the halt. And similarly, if a gene would confer a certain function, but that will not be linked to survival, we will lose this essential link. So when performing laboratory evolution, one would have to find a way to ensure this link between these like three levels of, of the process. And there, there have been and there are kind of, and once you have this link, you can then perform these cycles of creating genetic diversity, selecting it, and again, mutating and selecting. There are various tricks or ways to do this. 
but they are all kind of haunted by how huge is sequence space and how daunting is this search for sequence changes that may change the function. So this is the, you know, an average protein is 200 amino acid long. So this polypeptide chain is built of subunits called amino acids, and they're around 200 here linked. And there are 20 different amino acids, which means that there are 20 to the power of 200 permutations of this sequence. Moreover, every sequence change is context dependent. So it, a given sequence change will do one thing if it's in this context and quite another if it's in a different context. And one would have to look for these beneficial sequence changes, for these beneficial mutations from very large sequence spaces. You know, the maximum being this. This is a well or, or much more than we have atoms in this universe, of course. And this is why kind of at the beginning of this field of, of, of in vitro evolution or laboratory evolution, people were following the slogan of the more the better, meaning the higher diversities you can put to selection, the better. And this gave rise to this uh, technology that I developed while in Cambridge with Andrew Griffiths, I think, the, that uses water droplets of a water in oil emulsion. So these are water droplets that are stabilized by surfactant with a diameter of about two micron and a volume in the order of 10 to the minus 15 liter. And in each of these droplets, one can put like individual genes that are then transcribed and translated to give the protein molecule. And in this way, compartmentalize the gene with the protein it encodes, with the function exerted by this protein. And then if you have a mean of putting a selection so only those genes confer the right function survive, you can have this link between the gene, the function, and survival and do these evolutionary cycles. The advantage of this technology is it's that in something like half a milliliter of this, what looks like hand cream, you can have more than 10 to the 11 discrete droplets, each of which can contain a different gene variant. So it has a very high throughput. This technology is used for molecular evolution to perform laboratory evolution but also for essentially it's a way of miniaturizing, if you like, biochemical and genetic reactions. So it's used in the variety of applications, including like high throughput sequencing and, and medical genetics and so on and so forth. Uh, but what I'd like today to, to focus on more is the process itself of how we move from a starting point to an end point and what kind of sequence and structure changes underline this process. And to ignore also for a moment the, the applicative side of it because I guess you realize that if you have a method by which you can evolve proteins with essentially any given function or many functions, that can be dictated before, you can have many applications that you can tackle because nature only created en enzymes for those processes that nature needs. But I will have decided no, not to, to dwell on that, but to really try and, and you know, discuss with you a bit the fundamentals of the process. And I begin with kind of what dawned on, on us maybe five or six years ago, whether this business of needing so, so much throughput of experiments with 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 12 different gene variants in a single experiment makes sense. And why, despite having this high throughput, we fail so often to evolve proteins. And just to put things into perspective, it's estimated that the entire gene diversity on this planet, including polymorphisms, these are individual differences, say, between people in this audience, is 10 to the power of 15. 
So essentially, in these experiments, we only have maybe 1,000-fold lower diversity, but we have not yet managed to evolve anything that is even close to this bacterial pesticide-degrading enzyme that I mentioned. So at some point, we switch to try to understand the fundamentals of the process, to wonder whether we are really understand protein evolution. Maybe there is more to it than just hammering mutations and selection. And this was done, so all the experiments I will show you were actually done with very kind of low-tech and low-throughput screening using traditional methods where you transform the libraries to bacteria, play them on agar plates, take the colonies to 96 well plates, and examine the levels of activity with some chromogenic substrate, for example. So this is kind of done with much smaller libraries, typically maybe 1,000 up to, I would say, million gene variants in opposed to 10 to the 10 with emulsions, but they provided interesting insights that I will try to uh, discuss briefly. So basically the question we were asking, still asking, is what makes protein evolve? What, what properties make them evolvable? and whether we can enhance these properties in any way or, or, or exploit them. So this is kind of equivalent to what climbers call finding the path of least resistance. So the idea is that here is the starting point, which is a day's climb. This is the peak of Jabal Ram. There are numerous ways to get from here to there. But the vast majority of them end with one broken bone or, or all bones broken, as the statistics show very well. There are few ways by which you can get intact to the summit and, and, and go down kind of in, in one piece. And that's what the path of least resistance is about. And that's what proteins do, as I will try to, to convince you in a moment. So I will start with highlighting two properties that are generally not associated with proteins, at least not at the textbook level. Uh, and these are their functional promiscuity and their plasticity of structures. So essentially, I mean, when I was an undergraduate, I think when you, you were undergraduates, we were taught now, about proteins, using this uh, analogy of the lock and key, which is actually quite old, it originated with Emil Fischer, by which if you look at the relationships, if you like, between its pro a protein and its ligand, if you like, an enzyme and its substrate, yes, um, you would see this perfect fit or perfect complementarity in shape, which is enforced by numerous kind of interactions, doesn't matter what, what they are, but the essence of it is this perfect fit between the target of the protein and the protein's active site. Implicit in this view is the idea that if we have one sequence, one gene or one DNA sequence that encodes one protein sequence, we also have a single three-dimensional structure, well-defined three-dimensional structure, and a single well-defined function. This view, which is nice and can explain many properties of proteins, does not explain why proteins can change and evolve so rapidly. It is admittedly kind of in concert with the idea that proteins are highly specialized, and highly proficient in the task they perform, what I showed you before, but it doesn't explain why they can change so rapidly. So in the last kind of I don't know, decade or so, uh, several groups, including mine, were trying to point out that the key to protein evolution is not the perfection of protein structure and function, but the imperfections that are embedded in proteins. And this kind of became the, the new view, which we are now trying to change to the avant-garde view, but doesn't matter the, the titles. But the idea is that proteins 
that are generally known to us as one structure and one perfectly matching active site are actually flexible molecules that exist as an ensemble of conformations, not as a single conformation, that are all in equilibrium. One of these conformations, sometimes the, 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 the primary or the main one, is the conformation known to us from this lock and key picture and what we would call the native conformation. That is the three-dimensional structure that performs the function for which this protein has evolved. However, these alternative conformations may do other things. So the idea is that one or more of these alternative conformations can mediate alternative functions that have never been under selection, so they are not linked to the evolutionary history of the protein. They are not linked to the physiology or to today's physiology, but they could be performed by the protein. These are called promiscuous function. Don't blame me, I haven't chosen this name. I, I adopted it from others. Uh, because usually promiscuity is, is you know, linked with a sexual infidelity, but here it means infidelity in, in recognition of function, if you like. These functions are very weak, as I'll show you in the moment. And they are normally in, have no significance, but if and when evolution requires a new function, it will be created not just taken out of the blue, but the argument is that it would be using a promiscuous function of an existing protein whose original function is different as a starting point for the process of evolving a new enzyme. And this idea has been, I, th I think, kind of supported strongly. Maybe this is one of the early experimental supports by Leo James, who was a postdoc with me, where we could show that this antibody, a single antibody, single polypeptide chain, could f change its conformation and give you at least two modes. In one of them, it has this binding site that is deep and narrow and binds this small molecule. And the other conformation, endowed by exactly the same sequence, has this flat binding site that can bind the protein ligand. So a single sequence gives rise to multiple structures and to multiple binding sites. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's exactly what evolution will do. Should, I mean, the immune system evolved this antibody to recognize this ligand. This is a side conformation that is promiscuously used. As we will see, mutations can very easily shift the equilibrium, so this becomes the main function, and this is, becomes kind of a, a secondary one. So this is exactly this idea that mutations could now, if this promiscuous function becomes under selection, mutations can shift this equilibrium. So this becomes the primary native function of the new protein, and this will be largely forgotten in due course. So just to provide you kind of an example for this idea, we were looking for the evolutionary origins of this paroxone degrading enzyme that we discussed before. And what Livnata Friat did, a student in my lab, was to go to the database and look for sequences that show some homology, some resemblance in sequence to that enzyme. They were all annotated electronically by virtue of this homology as putative organophosphate or pesticide hydrolases. But there were some distinct features in the sequence that suggested to us that they might be doing something different. <laughs> so Livnat went and isolated three of these genes from different bacteria and expressed them and purified them and characterized their biochemical features. Now this is looking for a needle in the haystack because a priori I'll tell you that 
when we looked for the pesticide degrading activity, it was either very low or, or could not be detected. By combination of, of chance and the prepared mind, we kind of converged eventually on the function of these enzymes being to hydrolyze these compounds that are called lactones. And it seems that the specific substrate for these enzymes, by measures again of this catalytic efficiency, K cat over Km, are a group of lactones that are used by bacteria for what's called quorum sensing. So bacteria secrete these compounds, and when their neighbors sense high concentrations of them, they know that their numbers have exceeded a certain level, and then like human beings, they become aggressive, they become virulent. So many of the pathogenic bacteria have this mechanism, and they become kind of nasty when they sense these molecules, because then they know that they've become too many, and they essentially don't mind destroying the host. And it turns out that the function of these enzymes, that are these, are these close relatives of, of the pesticide degrading enzymes, are all enzymes that specialize in hydrolyzing this molecule and in quenching the quorum sensing signal. They also, it turns out, that certain members of this family have lower activity in degrading this pesticide. So if the original function was in the order of 10 to the 6, the side activity is in some of them even 100-fold lower, 10 to the 4, and in some of them it's a million-fold lower. But it was present in all the family members we tested. Why was it present there? We think that this is, again, a promiscuous function, a breach of specificity, if you like, some imperfection of molecular recognition. Because these enzymes, by following their phylogeny and their, their species and so on, have evolved at least 100 million years ago, if not more, well before this pesticide appeared on this planet. By, by virtue of having this promiscuous side activity, one of these members of this family could be used as a starting point to evolve the pesticide degrading enzyme. And indeed, when he tested the paraoxonase, the paraoxone degrading enzyme, we could see traces, very low activity as a lactonase. So the enzyme kind of retained a bit of what its ancestor was doing. But it largely switched function to, to do this rather than that. But in the absence of a starting point that would have some activity towards this chemical, I think that this process could not have happened so rapidly as it did. It turns out, and this is the work of Amir Aroni, who was a postdoc in my lab, who is now in Ben Gurion, that these promiscuous coincidental activities have an interesting feature that we dubbed like the evolvability of promiscuous functions. And they behave in a way which is very different than the function for which the protein has evolved from the native or the main function. So this is an experiment, laboratory evolution experiment, along the lines I explained. We took the starting point enzyme, uh, that is a lactonase, subjected it to random mutagenesis to create a library, and then screened it for increased activity with a given promiscuous substrate. And on the here is the activity of the mutants towards this substrate relative to wild type. This is a log scale. So when you do this process for maybe three rounds of mutation and selection, you are, Amir could isolate variants that have two point mutations or three point mutations, sequence changes relative to the starting point. And the promiscuous function under selection increased on average by about 100-fold. These are the blue bars. So these variants are 100-fold faster in 
transforming these molecules relative to the starting point, to the wild-type enzyme. However, when AMIR tested their activity towards the original substrate, we noticed that they, this activity has hardly, has hardly been affected. So it went down by maybe a few folds or even remained the same. So it seems that these mutations that were selected only by virtue of increasing the promiscuous function do so, but they don't do so at the expense of the existing function or what will become the old function when these enzymes will evolve towards the, the new function. And this suggested this idea So um, if, you, if you said that those enzymes were developed around 100 million years at least, um, and all those functions were unnecessary until today, how come they, they were so preserved until today without any changes or mutations um, so excluding the, them? So this is exactly the point that they were not preserved because if you look at like three or now we know six members of this family, all of them have very high activity in hydrolyzing the lactones, the quorum sensing lactones, because this is their function. And, but the activity of degrading the pesticide is, is there or not. So it fluctuates. So some members have like K cut over KM of 0.5, others have to attend to the four. Yes, because it's never, it's a good question, but because they've never, this activity has not been under selection, and it's a mere coincidence, it disappeared in some genes and appears in relatively high rate with others, yes, but without any relation to the original, to the native function, because the native function is essentially the same in all of them. And this is what we will see in a moment, uh, how this process occurs. And the reason it occurs is actually because of that idea that there are mutations that can increase a promiscuous function that may become eventually the new function of a gene without initially coming at the expense of the primary or the native function. So this is kind of lack of trade-off or weak trade-off because in general evolutionists believe in trade-offs of function. So at least according to evolutionists, one cannot be rich, beautiful, and smart, although there are you know, anecdotal examples that that may happen. If you evolve to be smarter, you have to become uglier and vice versa and so on and so forth. And there are numerous examples for that in organismal evolution, that adaptation towards a given environment comes at the expense of, of other environments. But it seems that with respect to these promiscuous functions, there is initially this idea that you can gain something for nothing without paying anything. And this kind of leads to the next topic, which is the adaptive potential of neutral mutations. I think this was kind of implicit in one of the, of the, the, the talks before, and this is the work of Gil Amitai and Rinko Devi Gupta, two postdocs in the lab. And the idea would be was to see what will happen as proteins drift in evolution as any other gene or protein drifts along evolutionary time. That is accumulating mutations while maintaining its original function and structure. This is what some evolutionists would call a neutral drift because it would be equivalent to my, what my our generation would call full gas be neutral, meaning you spend a lot of energy but nothing happens, yes? But because mutations are constantly appearing, purifying selection would act on them. Purifying selection would act on them 
and would remove any mutation that is deleterious to the function of the protein. However, there would be still mutations that are not harmful and will be retained in the population. And this is why if you were looking at the sequence of gene X in us versus our ancestors, say, a million years ago, the sequence has changed. The protein has not. It's still doing the same function, exactly the same function with the same efficiency. But the sequence keeps drifting while acquiring mutations that are considered neutral. So another way of presenting it that has been popular with physicists and so on is in a neutral network where you have a starting point, what we call, say, a wild type, that start accumulating mutations and starts going away from the initial sequence. But in terms of fitness or level of function, this is flat, meaning all these sequence variations have the same function. So Gil and Rinko went to imitate that process in the lab. So they performed an experiment with the same philosophy that you've seen before of introducing mutations and random and selecting, but this one time not to change the function, but just retain it. And I'll, I'll spare you the details, but they isolated about, they repeated this process for several generations, isolated several hundred mutants or gene variants of the initial gene that exhibit roughly the same level of function as the starting point gene. And we also monitored expression levels to try and ensure that also the stability and the fold of the protein has not changed dramatically. So again, the native function, the primary function of that, of these variants is largely the same as wild type. However, when you test these promiscuous secondary functions, you see that they have changed significantly. So you always see some variants, yes, out of the 300 that would show large increases, sometimes even up to 50-fold in these promiscuous functions that are not under selection. So this kind of helped us and others to imagine this idea that was first envisaged by Maynard Smith, actually, very long ago, even before network became a buzzword, of these networks of sequences and how proteins traverse them by unit mutational steps, that is, by one mutation at a time. But what happens is that if we have a switch in function or phenotype from activity A in black to activity B in red, while drifting neutrally, this protein can get close to this perimeter and then cross to the new function within one or two mutations. So I think this was the, the question before to say, you know, maybe some of the mutations that were eventually needed to mediate this transition were acquired even before selection for that transition appeared. And this is exactly the case. It seems that while drifting neutrally under selection to maintain the original function, many of the mutations that get acquired can then provide the springboard or can get the protein much closer to this transition than you know, this sequence or that sequence. And that seems to be the secret of many evolutionary processes that they were initiated by mutations that were appeared well before the selection pressure for adaptation emerged. Why should the, those function, uh, as you see in this graph, are there's a chance that they will get better and stronger. Why should they, why don't they just disappear with the natural drift but getting stronger? So that's the, the, the thing, that in one variant they disappear. Say, for example, if you look at the variants that are closer here in this very schematic view, then this particular function has almost disappeared. 
So they are much worse than your starting point if you had to evolve to red. But these ones are much closer. And the idea is that, of course, if evolution does not work on an individual, it works on a whole population. So this, would, this whole network would imitate the population, the genetic diversity that you see in humans, in E. coli, it doesn't matter which organism and in which niche. So some of these variants within the population are closer to the transition than others. And if you add another thousand steps, because you, at least as far as I can see, there's a few steps that you have seen here, but if you add another thousand steps, it will still look like this? Yeah, so you will keep expanding this network and expanding it. And of course, you know, the, as I said, the same enzyme, I mean, if you look at the basic enzymes that are in each and every organism, they are thought to have been in what is called the last universal common ancestor, the first kind of you know, nearly complete organism about three and a half, three and a half billion years ago that then diverged to everything that we see today. The sequence of that protein has changed enormously. Probably 70% of the amino acids are now different than they were before, although its function remained the same. So this process of drifting neutrally continues all the time. Essentially, it's a question of population sizes, yes? If you have a very small population, you will sample a very small and sporadic part of that network. If you have a large population, you will sample a more extensive part of it, and then you are more likely to hit on something that is here or there, depending on the direction that this protein or organism will evolve into. Seder, <laughs> seder. If you draw such a, a neutral uh, network around the U function, then they must overlap because uh, you had some variants that uh, have this function, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. uh, And then you could ask, uh, does the overlap size matter? I mean, with some proteins, you'd have uh, a huge... Uh, it does, because yeah. the overlaps are, so the idea is that this now describes this, you know, gradual and smooth transition that I was highlighting in the beginning, where you can move one mutation at a time and switch from function black to function red. You know, how overlapping is this work works will basically determine what is the likelihood for the adaptation or the likelihood of acquiring a new function. If these two networks overlap significantly, the likelihood of traversing, you know, this is the Maynard Smith term, of traversing sequence space from here to there would be very high. But it, if they are just, you know, touching at one specific point, that it is, there is only one specific sequence change that will trigger it, the likelihood of doing this switch in function will be low. Is that what you... Yes, but if they overlap significantly, would you expect that there would be many variants? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so not, the degree... Not, not only in the way, but uh, I mean... Yeah, uh, definitely. And we see that some proteins show high neutrality. That means there are many sequences that will give you the same function and structure. Some show low neutrality. That is, only few sequences will give you this structure and function. Why this is the case is not entirely understood, but certainly different proteins will differ in the size of, of their network, in the volume of the network. This, of course, you know, simplified because it has many dimensions and so on, but... So we discussed the issue of promiscuity and conformational plasticity and the adaptive potential of neutral mutations. Well, how are we doing with time? I don't Okay, a little plow on. When you become impatient, just give me a signal. Yeah, I have a question, please. <laughs> um, as I listen, I, I keep thinking about the idea of survival of the flattest. Yeah. You, you know... Yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with it. To Eigen's ideas about quasi-species. So this is very much related to it, because the flattest are 
This is exactly what we've discussed Where your before. Diversity. The flattest would mean that they have a large you know, network that they can form or new, a large neutrality. This relates to the size of it. So many, many sequences will encode, will give you the same solution. So then the likelihood of finding something that will easily traverse is high. So you have many quasi-species, you know, many people use different terminology. And this would facilitate the, the, the transition. So it's exactly this, this idea. This idea is especially compelling when you look at uh, viroids, short pieces of RNA, which aren't even long enough to code for protein. So in a sense, their genotype is their phenotype. All they do is yeah. get replicated, and their molecular evolution experiments have been done where you literally look directly at the uh, genetic diversity, and yeah. you're, you're looking at the equivalent of your protein promiscuity. Uh, yeah, so this, I think, you know, this is the Spiegelman experiment that inspired a lot of you know, what became then Eugen and these ideas. In essentially, just an anecdote, it's known now that this experiment is an artifact. It's not templateless, but it still it shows you that even if, you know something that began as a mistake became hugely inspiring to 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 many people. So it's this idea that again, and this draws on this you know against or, or a contrast to this idea that of the Emil Fisher model of one sequence giving you one structure and only one function, yes? But rather, you know, some kind of an overlap between the sequences and the structures and the functions. There is a very strong assumption here that each protein evolves on, on its own and it's not that, you know, a bunch of proteins in an yeah. organism evolve to solve a certain need. Yeah, so it's this was, I answered, I think it was raised before, that this is how I make my living from oversimplification, from isolating, you know, a single gene, a single protein, because you can then better understand the, you know, the mechanisms, the details of the process. But... Of course, when you look at organisms, the same would apply, yes? The same would apply to regulatory networks, to metabolic networks, and so on. It just becomes no, maybe but, more complicated to, to analyze. No, but, but, but you see, if, if the, this thing is flat, uh, as was defined uh, before, it means that to meet a certain function, many proteins will try to adapt to that, yeah. per, that particular and, and still no interaction between... Uh, no, no, there would be lots of interactions on, you know, many of the processes would regard interactions bef between proteins, not necessarily nuanced, uh, no, not, you know, just, but, you know, at least at the level of a single protein, we can translate that to, to mutations and map, you know, this network and so on. It's important to say that this is flat only when you look at it from one angle, and that is the fitness in the current environment, okay? What I was trying to, to hint is that this is multidimensional, yes? If you do a cross-section with respect to the current circumstances, this is flat. However, if you do a different cross-section with a new environment, this is very rugged, very bumpy, because some of them are very, you know, high, and others are very low with respect to that function. And you can apply the same principle to organisms and, and you know, more complex entities. Um, yeah. um, before you, you gave up this picture of uh, peaks, of mountain peaks for proteins, and I guess you meant that you don't just that jump on the highest peaks, you, before you, you pass through peaks to get higher. And my question is, um, as I guess higher peaks mean more complex uh, proteins. So my question is, how do you do? You have a way of quantifying the height of the peak for proteins? No. So I think in this analogy, which is very problematic of like landscape and so on, that uh, one uses, the height is the fitness. Is you know how good this protein is with respect to to to, to the function. Okay. The sequences would be, you know, the different paths and so on, yes. But, of course, it's, you know, it's a problematic view because it's, it has n dimensions, so 
and we just see it on a... So the idea is that if you do a sequence walk from, from here to there, yes, this would mean that you constantly raise your fitness. The function will improve. And then there are different ways, sequence-wise, to approach it. Yes, and the line of least resistance would be just, you know, what is the minimal number of sequence changes that can get you in terms of fitness from here to up, up there. Okay, I, I mean more like you had an example before that you didn't m m made evolution in laboratory condition. You didn't, wasn't possible to make it. And maybe the problem was that the peak was too high to jump? To? Yeah. Okay, so can you think of an example of uh, a protein to start with without any phases? Like something very simple system that you can... But, but well, what do you mean without any phases? Like, I, well, it seems maybe the problem is that you need to first um, um, every, every time change to a different and more complex, to adapt to a different and more complex system. Right. No, but I mean, but you know, the experiment or the model I'm presenting is quite simple. You need function A, you know this, and you start from a protein with function B. And I was making the argument that you need function, the new function, function A, has to be present in B to some degree as a coincidence, as an accident, and so on. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, it's a single dimension climb, yes? So just the, the altitude is, you know, how much you have of A. In reality, things are far more complicated. Uh, one more question. Uh, maybe I'm asking the same question as um, this gentleman asked. I just didn't understand it completely. But if I'm trying to, um, to take this principle of uh, those uh, networks you're talking about to macro evolution, let's call it this way. So how come we don't see um, continuity between different species? Of course we see it. No, but it's not, it's it's not like, um, well, but it's not that continuous, I mean. No, no, it's continuous. I mean, the thing is that, okay. you know, we are the ancestors of tomorrow's, you know, homo sapiens and so on. It's just that the very same thing happens to with organisms and with proteins. When you look at the end products of evolution, you see leaps. You see big differences. You see apes and you see humans because we lost all the intermediates, yes? So this makes it kind of difficult sometimes to figure out how you know, apes and humans diverge from a common ancestor, yes? Or how bacteria and humans diverge from a common ancestor because we lost all the intermediates. So, so the leaps? So yeah, because all, you know, by definition, what we see are only end products, yes? But this is what leaps today. If we find the fossil, yes, in a sense, these proteins that I showed you with these you know, mutations that increase one, they are like fossils. They are molecular fossils of a process that has been completed now. So you actually explain all those leaps in a matter of selection? Uh, or uh, just yeah, and in losing the the intermediates, yes. So again, so, you know, why, why did we lose the intermediates? Because because, because of the again, by definition, an intermediate is something that existed in the past and then yeah. is extinct. Yes. So it's the okay. same, you know, the, it's the same picture like with proteins. We look now at two proteins. We we see that they are related because half of the sequence is identical. We imagine that they diverge from a common ancestor. But we don't have all the sequences that separate between the contemporary, you know, two proteins and the common ancestor. And this is the power of these experiments, that they give us some glimpse about what has happened on the way. And the same holds for, for organisms. So I'll, I'll just go briefly through another point that relates to structural plasticity. It's, and that is that you know, this model of an ensemble of conformations was thus far applied to, you know, the active site where the, you know, these enzymes where they catalyze these reactions, yes? The examples I've given you are for, of, say, local changes in the active sites, movements of individual amino acids or maybe three or four amino acids. But in general, proteins also have what we call the scaffold, 
which is the rest of this long, complicated polypeptide chain that holds this active site. And that scaffold is considered very rigid and that has not, something that has not changed since the, the, you know, the times that the first proteins evolved, yes? It's like in a building where it was redone, you know, from offices to, to I don't know, to labs and then to, to uh, accommodation and so on, but the scaffold, the building has, has remained the same. However, it turns out that also the scaffold of the protein can be plastic and evolvable. I'll just show you briefly one example coming from the work of Itamar Yadid. And what Itamar did is to take a protein, which is called tachylectin 2, which is a sugar binding protein, it's a lectin, that shows high symmetry in the sequence. And we thought that another thing, that these proteins that show high internal symmetry, they may have evolved from smaller elements that then were duplicated and fused together, yeah? So it's the kind of protein where you could see the building block and say, okay, maybe this evolved first and then five of those kind of were assembled together to give us the modern protein that we see today. So what Itamar did is to take the gene that encodes this 240 amino acid and truncate it in a random manner from two ends, from the N terminus and the C terminus, to generate a library of small fragments. And then this library was screened for the function of the wild type protein, of the, the original protein. And Itamar isolated fragments of 94 amino acids, so they are two fifths of the original protein, that gave the same function. And they did so by assembling into a pentamere. So they are, this, the protein is now not a single polypeptide chain, but five polypeptide chains assembled together to give you something larger. And we were kind of scratching our heads how this could occur, how this transition from a monomere, one polypeptide chain of 240 into a pentamere of five times 94 occurred, and then Itamar solved the crystal structure, and we realized that this protein did a very kind of nice trick that we could not envisage, that although the sequence of all the five subunits was identical, the structure was not. So four of them were like pieces taken from the original protein, this is the yellow, and one of them rearranged completely, so this is the scaffold rearranged completely, to enable their assembly in, in a pentamere, yeah? So it's not just that individual amino acids can move to give you these alternative functions, but the whole scaffold of the protein can change. So again, this is the very same sequence rearranging in a different structure to enable this evolutionary transition. So this scheme can be extended not just to, you know, as, as shown here, to small changes in the active site, but to the rearrangement of the entire protein to facilitate the evolution of, of new scaffolds. Last feature I want to highlight very briefly of, of mechanisms that nature uses to facilitate the evolution of proteins relates to the issue of stability. So, Stability is basically the ability of a protein to form these nice structures that would then give you the function. And this is the work of Noboto Kariki, another postdoc, very talented and dedicated guy. And until five years ago, if you were asking protein scientists, including myself, whether proteins care about mutations, they, we would say no. I mean, you can, most mutations do nothing to the protein. You know, it's such a robust entity, the survival of the flatters, that the mutations just, you know, unless you hit some very sensitive residue, nothing will happen. But it turns out that proteins are very sensitive to sequence changes. And about half of the sequence changes undermine the stability of the structure and therefore are purged by evolution. So as a protein drifts in sequence, <clears throat> it has this blue zone which is considered neutral 
in terms of stability and any mutation that goes beyond that blue zone would be purged, would not be tolerated. The problem is that mutations that mediate new function, even these mutations that I showed you before that increase these promiscuous functions, tend to undermine the stability to a degree often that goes just under this blue zone. And we could unravel two mechanisms by which nature deals with it. One is compensatory mutations that have been known by evolutionists for many years, that following by the acquisition of a new function, another mutation would come which would compensate for this loss of stability. But we were wondering whether you could predict these, these mutations in advance. And this was the work of, of Shimon Bernstein, who realized that these compensatory mutations have a very interesting feature. And that is that they bring the sequence of a protein. So say you perform evolution with any contemporary family member. This is a phylogenetic tree. You find that all the compensatory mutations occurred such that the sequence in this particular position went back to resemble the inferred ancestor of the family. This protein that existed maybe in this case 20 million years ago that gave rise to the divergence of all the family members. If you start actually from a protein that already carries these compensatory mutations, this analogy is maybe not so good because despite the fact that I smile, I mean, I now know that for climbers, the rappelling down is the most horrific part and most prone to accidents. But at the time, I thought it's much more fun to, to go downhill. So actually, these days, what we do is when we wish to evolve a certain protein, rather than using a wild type, a, a gene encoding a contemporary family member, we built kind of this tree, phylogenetic tree of the family, infer by methods of molecular biology the sequence of the ancestor, the family ancestor, and then use this as the starting point. And it turns out that these sequences are far more evolvable than the contemporary family members. So just to continue the kind of family, the, the you know, climbing analogy. Here is where it doesn't work. This is a contemporary topic. This is my son. And this is kind of the family ancestor, me here. Although this slide is somewhat unfair, because what you see here, that what you, what you don't see here, that this crack is about 20 meters deep. And if you fall, it's, it's really unpleasant. But since then, I've done something about my you know, kind of much inferior capabilities relative to the contemporary topic. And I'm proud to say that we climbed this about two months ago. This is called the beauty for a very good reason in, in Wadi Ram. The problem is that since this, he has progressed maybe three levels up. So I'm, I'm still trying to catch up. Another way that nature uses very often to solve this stability problem, the fact that when you have a mutation that gives you the new function, it may interfere with the structure of the protein, with its folding to give you the, the structure, and that is chaperones. So again, I won't go into details, but these are cellular machines that help proteins to fold. And it's been speculated for a long time that evolution is assisted by chaperones, because if you have a mutation that has a potential to acquire a new function but interferes with the folding of the proteins, the chaperones may rescue it. And this is what exactly what Nobo has seen is in his experiments. So if you perform, just to give you the, the highlight of it, if you perform this trick of incorporating genetic diversity and selecting for a given function, Without chaperones or in the presence of chaperones, the outcome is very different. So this is the activity of the evolved variants relative to the wild type, and this is a log scale. So this is with chaperones, this is without, and you can see that the activity of the evolved variants is much higher, and the numbers 
here there are about eight, whereas two, only two here. And the reason we could find, and this is the, again the advantage of going from a whole organism to a single protein, is that you can assign it to a given sequence change. And it turns out here that there is a single mutation that is very advantageous for this function. However, it's undermining the folding of the protein. So in the absence of the chaperones, you don't see this mutation because if it appears, the protein does not fold and you get zero activity. However, when you turn on the chaperones, this mutation can appear and can give rise to the, the new function. So chaperones are also a key to rapid acquisition of functions in, in proteins. To just summarize, I'd like again to, you know, maybe the take home message is that proteins maintain this duality of being highly specialized and proficient on the one hand, but also highly evolvable on the other. And this relates to this issue that on the one hand they are perfect, and on the other they are imperfect. And also the, in my own kind of development of my own kind of history in, in science, it's the, the first comes the power of technology that makes you think you can do anything, but understanding is much more powerful. I think when you know how nature does it, you can do the same thing with you know, very modest, low-tech means that you couldn't do within even the most advanced technology. And just to, to highlight these five kind of features that underline the line of least resistance, uh, my son is somewhere up there. This is called the Inferno, this face. It's the promiscuity of function, the side accidental functions, the plasticity of both the active sites and the scaffolds of the proteins, the issue of what mut how neutral mutations can promote adaptation and the buffering mechanisms that I discussed. And just to make sure I leave you with the names of the people who are behind uh, this work. And thanks very much for your patience. Thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. Uh, we were very active during the lecture asking question, but still there is room for more. So, if somebody wants to raise a question now. Yes. Follow, <coughs> follow your uh, logic that you show on us. We should find uh, enzymes that uh, have many functions. And we do. Most and of them, I mean most of them don't. Uh, I don't know. Let's, I would put it this way, that for most of them we don't know. But I mean, there is a, a very significant fr number of enzymes for which we now realize that there are sec secondary functions that have physiological meaning. And the examples that I favor are perhaps the most specific enzymes are the enzymes that are involved in, de in synthesis of proteins, yes? Because they have to be accurate. Otherwise, although the... DNA template has a certain sequence, the proteins that are translated will have errors. So these are enzymes that are called tRNA synthetases that load the right amino acid on the right tRNA. They are highly specific, but it's now known that they mediate a whole range of, of functions, such as synthesizing signaling molecules and editing RNA and so on and so forth. And there are many examples now for secondary functions that, again, are used by the, the physiology, so they're not promiscuous anymore. I assume because they are organism-specific, yes, these tRNA synthetases are in each and every organism. This function was, appears in, you know, here and there, that they were recruited as a second stage f from a promiscuous function, yes? So I think this notion, even uh, in the cell of one enzyme, one function, is a, is a very rough approximation. Room for more questions? Ah, yes, up there.
How many um, uh, base pair changes can you have in the, from your wild type to um, some other protein and still maintain the function? So that, I mean, depends how, how you define a new function. If you, I can tell you that on average, if you start from something that is maybe, typically these promiscuous functions are three to five orders of magnitude weaker than the, what you know, a normal enzyme would be. If you start for that and you aim at bringing it to a level of uh, full activity, it would require, on average, I would say, between 15 to 30 mutations, sequence okay. changes. So it would mean changing approximately between five, I would say approximately five to 10% of the sequence, roughly. How does that work with the um, original example you showed us where um, the um, new um, uh, enzyme was actually like 50% different than uh, what you started with? To, no, I showed 50%. Yeah. I said that now when you compare, when you look at contemporary proteins, I think that that's what I would, when you look at proteins from the same, you know, that are related, to see two different functions would be at least 50% difference in sequence. In most cases, I would say 70%. So you are talking about probably 5 to 10% that are related to the change of function, and the remaining 45 to 70% are just drift since the time these two functions have diverged. Okay. Um, throughout the talk, you talked about uh, protein. It, uh, and it gained its functionality uh, with this, on the same protein. But there are cases when um, the protein is duplicated and then it looks like it's more freely evolved. And is the gradual and smooth evolution still applies to the duplicated copy? Because okay, so they, this is a kind of a painful point in, you know, if there were evolutionists here, they were, uh, it's a big debate about that. I mean, the idea is the following. Nowadays, when we see two proteins with two different functions, so they are evolution related, they will be duplicate. It will look like two different proteins, yes? Yeah? So clearly, this process evolves by starting from one gene, one protein, ending up with two. But there is a huge dispute around the time of duplication so say the more traditional evolutionists would say duplication occurs before selection is just a neutral event and the gene will acquire any mutation. It can be a, you know, a deleterious mutation that will lead to the gene disappearing or something that become beneficial and so on. And the more modern ones, including myself, would say the duplication will occur after these mutations that we have seen that increase the promiscuous function maybe 100 or 1,000 fold, then you, it would have to trade off, yes? The idea is that to, you can bet this something for nothing only for a, a short while, but at the end of the day, if you need to wear, go all the way through and acquire these 15, 30 mutations and bring this new function to a level, optimal level, you have to give up the old function. So you would have to duplicate so that one copy maintains the old function and one diverges to the new function. But again, you know, when duplication occurs, under what selection pressure, what is the path, could be the top, is, is the topic of whole symposium. We thank you very much. It was an excellent yeah. lecture. Yeah. And before...